Hey everyone, I'm Alfonso and welcome to this workshop on the essentials of urban sketching. Um, I'm really excited about this workshop and glad you guys decided to join in. Um, you won't only be learning about the essentials necessarily, but I'll be sharing with you some invaluable tips that have helped me tremendously in my process and hopefully will help you too. Okay, so this workshop is divided into four parts. In part one, we'll be looking at some of the basic materials, just some basic supplies that I believe that you need. And I'll uh, we'll be going over some drawing fundamentals, as well as taking a look at some of the basic aspects of watercolor. And in part two, we'll be looking at how to break down and simplify a scene. So at least you can uh, kind of get an understanding of what you're looking at. And in part three, uh, here we'll actually discuss some design concepts like uh, emphasis, contrast and so on and in final we will actually close out with a demo drawing which i'll walk you through my process step by step so you can have an idea of how i actually start from beginning to end so let's get started now when it comes to urban sketching uh, you have a wide variety of materials and supplies to choose from now depending on your style of course your comfort uh, your budget, of course, and just your basic preference. And while I feel uh, you should definitely explore as many as you can, I don't necessarily believe that you should burden yourself with a cumbersome baggage of stuff. You know, just try to keep it really simple, light, and practical. Urban sketching is a truly fun uh, and really liberating experience. And I believe the simpler you keep uh, your supplies, you know, especially if you're moving around, you know, because you want to keep that experience spontaneous and immediate. And that's a part of the fun and the joys of, you know, going around and sketching. You want to be able to just grab your stuff and get going. So what I'll do is I'm going to share 10 basic types of supplies that I believe is invaluable for your arsenal. And this is assuming that you also want to do some watercolor eventually. But if you don't, you know, that means this list will even be shorter for you. So here they are. Paper is important. Um, this is the thing that's preserving your work. You wouldn't want to spend a lot of money and time and creative effort in creating something really beautiful that you cherish so much and then it deteriorates in no time. You know, so it's really important that you, you really get the best quality paper that you can afford. So what are some properties to look for? One, ensure your paper is acid free. Acid free paper is more capable to withstand uh, the deteriorating effects of light. So your art can really last a long time. For ink drawing, smooth bristle paper like the Strathmore 500 series is best. There's no bleeding. Uh, nibs, you, you know, your pen nibs will really glide effortlessly smooth and tiny details are no issue. And plus, it can withstand layers of inking and the most abrasive erasing. Now, bristle paper can handle wet media, but watercolor is best applied to watercolor paper. All right. So generally, at least a 140 pound weight like this Strathmore 500 series cold press sheet would be excellent for that. Um, whether you sketch on a single sheet, a drawing pad, sketchbook or journal, try to use the best quality paper you can afford. Pencils are an indispensable supply, right? Uh, you want a lead that is not too hard and uh, not too soft, all right? Deep, soft leads like a 2B grade and higher often smudge easily and can be a bit troublesome to erase. And then on the other hand, hard uh, points like a 2H, uh, and anything higher than that, maybe too light, and can sometimes dig into the, the paper or whatever drawing surface that you're using. All right, so I usually recommend like an H or a HB or a B grade pencil. Those are generally best. Watercolor pencils are also nice. Uh, the good thing is you won't have to worry about your marks showing should you uh, later on apply watercolor because they will just dissolve away with whatever, what media you apply. Now, there are tons of pens to choose from. All right, technical drawing pens, fountain pens, dip pens, brush pens, ballpoint pens, rollerball pens. You know, try uh, to get pens, however, with permanent ink, all right, especially water resistant ink, and have at least two point sizes one fine, one medium, or bold, and that's it. Uh, there's no need to really go overboard with getting all these expensive pens. Just try to get at least uh, permanent ink, water resistant and uh, try to get at least two point sizes, a fine point and a bow point, and that's pretty much it. For erasing, you don't need more than a simple plastic or kneaded eraser, 
once it's gentle on the drawing surface and erases without leaving those uh, stainy smudges or smears, <laughs> that's fine. A ruler is super useful uh, for lines, angles, measurements, edges, you know, but this doesn't mean you won't be drawing your lines by hand. Of course you will. But sometimes a ruler is useful uh, to just place small dots that can serve as a guide for your sketching. If you're drawing trees, buildings, light poles, you know, horizons, and so on. A simple six inch rule is all you need. Some kind of a, a fastener is useful for holding down those stubborn sheets sometimes. So you can use something like a, a rubber band, uh, paper clips, or just a small piece of artist tape with a, a mild adhesive. So that's pretty much all you need. For urban sketching, you really don't need a large collection of colors. Um, actually, a basic palette is best, so you're not overwhelmed with choices, all right? Um, and plus, it pushes you to practice and get better at your mixing. Um, when selecting colors, try to get single pigment paints, all right? And uh, even a, a nice travel set like this one by uh, Dale Arani is pretty useful. It has a nice range of colors. There are a variety of brushes to choose from, um, but try to have at least two sizes one for fine details, one for bolder brushwork, uh, round, flat, natural, synthetic, that's down to your personal preference. But try to use brushes that hold water really well and can keep a sharp point, all right? So for undergo painting, uh, a pocket size brush is also awesome. Uh, water brushes for the inbuilt water reservoir are also useful, but be careful with them because uh, they really take some getting used to. So the simpler, the better. So if you'll be painting on the go, a small, tight, and durable water bottle is always useful. Um, I usually keep two of them. An absorbent like a piece of uh, paper towel, an old sock, uh, a washcloth is always useful for dabbing your brush to remove excess water. And plus, a little scrap of paper, you know, for testing your marks and uh, uh, your color mixes is also really useful. And perhaps the only other thing you really need is a container to put all your supplies in and uh, maybe a folded chair to sit or something like that. But other than that, you really don't need that many supplies to get you started. Now, a commonly overlooked but uh, really important aspect of drawing that can definitely affect your urban sketching, actually your drawing practice in general, uh, has to do with how you control your drawing instrument. All right. Now, remember, you'll be drawing buildings, uh, trees, roads, people, and all kinds of things. You know, So making small adjustments in the way you move your arm or hold your instrument can affect the quality of your marks significantly. Um, a general recommendation is to be aware of uh, one, the movement that occurs along the entire arm, right, from your fingers to your shoulders, all right? And also to be aware of how tightly you grip the drawing instrument. And three, how hard you press down. So those three factors are very important. The movement from your fingers to your shoulder, uh, uh, how tight, tightly you grip the, uh, the drawing instrument you're using, whether it's a pen or pencil, and how hard you press down on the drawing surface. Those three things are really important. Generally, uh, in making long strokes, like when you're drawing buildings, uh, roads, you know, the horizon or perspective lines, you try to move your entire arm as one unit. So you essentially kind of lock your elbows and let most of the movement revolve around your shoulders. So you're moving your entire arm as one. And uh, what this does is, is it enables you to make really long, continuous strokes in a very smooth and natural way. Also, relax your grip a bit and kind of rehearse the movement before making a mark so it will be really smooth and steady. Another basic aspect of drawing that is especially important to urban sketching is drawing lines, and especially vertical and horizontal lines. Now, these two lines are important to holding together uh, the structure of an image because you're drawing buildings and trees and roads and perspective lines and so on. So if these lines are not uh, sound, <laughs> if they're not well drawn, your drawing can become unstable and things can appear uh, imbalanced or like it's toppling over. So when drawing uh, vertical and horizontal lines, you don't necessarily have to use a ruler or a straight edge. In fact, I, I generally recommend that you practice drawing them freehand. But 
A simple technique that you can use is to just draw uh, small dots, like at the beginning of a line, at the end of the line, and at the midpoint. And then all you're doing is pretty much rehearsing your movement and then connecting the dots. This just helps to give you a bit more control and also um, don't try to make it perfectly straight either. If your lines wobble a bit, that's fine. Wobbly lines actually uh, generally have a bit more character and convey a sense of uh, a, a, a sense of life and movement, you know, much more than just perfectly straight lines. You know, they don't look as mechanical or geometric. You know, they look more full of life. Uh, more spontaneous and more expressive. Now a common issue in drawing with ink is whether to draw with ink only or with a pencil on the drawing. Now uh, there are pros and cons to both and I guess it depends on your style, uh, the subject uh, or the circumstance. So let's take a look at both. Now generally I recommend doing at least a simple pencil sketch before you do an ink drawing. Um, it doesn't have to be fully rendered. Uh, but, but just enough to kind of lay out the composition of the drawing before actually applying your ink work. The thing that I really like about having a, a pencil on the drawing is being able to try things and kind of experiment with your composition. All right. So what if you use this or that frame? You know, what if I include this or that detail? Um, what if I focus here instead of there? What if I make this tall or make that shorter? You know, a pencil on the drawing or a sketch uh, affords you, you know, to measure multiple times before you make the cut, so to speak. And why not allow yourself the opportunity to do that? You generally end up being more pleased with the composition anyway. And as I have said, the underdrawing doesn't have to be and shouldn't really be a finished drawing. Just a basic sketch, you know, that serves the purpose of giving you a guide to follow for your ink work or whatever, you know, watercolor or whatever you choose to use afterwards. Now, don't forget that with pencil, you're not just limited to doing an underdrawing, you know. Um, there are other types of information that you can add as well because you can easily erase it afterwards. So in addition to just doing an underdrawing, I sometimes uh, jot down a few notes, uh, reminders. I may even put a quick diagram. I may even put a value scale, things like that, you know, that serve as a reference that I know I can easily, you know, erase later on. And lastly, sketching things out with a pencil also forces you to take the time to make observations and think about your drawing before just jumping in. And this is very important because it allows you to explore ideas and questions and really interact with the scene before committing to it. You know, and this is something that sometimes we can get carried away and forget to do. Now, just jumping into an ink drawing with no pencil sketch around the drawing can be a bit intimidating. And, and of course, rightfully so. You know, you can't erase and each mark you make is permanent. But there is a sweet paradox here. And it's that uh, you are now free from that worry. All right. So there is something just so liberating and empowering in just freely creating a drawing in ink and not having to worry about erasing lines or correcting mistakes. Now, of course, it may not uh, necessarily be as easy as it sounds, you know, so I'm going to share some tips with you that I believe are pretty useful when it comes to just drawing straight in ink with no prior pencil sketch around the drawing that will hopefully ease your mind a bit. Now, since you won't be able to erase your lines, I advise you take some time to really look at your scene before you start drawing. So that way, when you actually start drawing, your lines will be more confident and uh, your drawing will be more purposeful. And you really have a sense of what you're doing. So what are some of the things to look for? Well, first you look for landmarks. Things in a scene that you think are structurally important for your drawing. Things that you believe will help you to construct the drawing more easily. Of course, these will vary from scene to scene, but there's some basic things to keep in mind, like uh, large and dominant shapes, uh, strong vertical, horizontal and diagonal lines, like the lines of perspective, uh, the edges of buildings. These are some of the basic things to look for that will help you to kind of like navigate your way through the drawing, even though you're using ink. Another tip is to try to gauge certain measurements before you actually start drawing. 
you know, just to get a sense of proportion. So make some comparative measurements. You know, how tall is uh, that building compared to this one? How wide is the house compared to how tall it is? Uh, is that window about half the size of the door or is the door about a third the height of the house and so on? You know, these are the types of comparison and measurements to get a sense of before you actually start drawing because then you, you have this subconscious sense of proportions that will be guiding your drawing. Now, when drawing with ink, if you're not careful, you can find out that a line is not straight when you're actually at the end of the line. I've made that mistake many times. And to avoid this, um, I use a system of dots. So I'll measure or guesstimate a distance or a position, make a mark, and then draw my line or shape or whatever it is. It's a very simple technique. Uh, and it will save you from making lots of mistakes, you know, leaves no mess, and allows you to draw with ink with confidence. So you're essentially guesstimating the distance of a position. Uh, you make a dot, and then you simply connect them. So let's talk about watercolor. It is such a beautiful and amazing medium. And although there is so much we could talk about, let's just go over some of the essentials. Now, just in case uh, you want to apply your uh, uh, watercolor to your urban sketches, you realize that there really isn't much you need to get started. Now, before we even talk about paints, let's talk about paper. Um, paper is very important. The type of paper you use can significantly affect the quality of your work. And as I had discussed before, it is important to use paper with the right weight, at least like a 140 pound, like this uh, 140 pound uh, cold press sheet here that I have from the Strathmore 500 series. Paper that is too low in weight may buckle when you apply wet media to it. So try your best to work with adequate weight watercolor paper. At least uh, try multimedia paper if you're not able to get your hands on some good quality watercolor paper. It is best to use a compact selection of colors that at least includes a warm and cool version of your reds, yellows, and blues. Because this will enable you to have the essential primary colors uh, that will enable you to mix a wide range of colors and hues, values, and saturations. A couple uh, a convenient green or two is useful. Uh, earth colors, of course, because they allow you to uh, create subdued and uh, muted mixes and grays. And uh, of course, are you know obviously super convenient for landscape painting in general. Now I'm going to share a few useful tips to keep in mind, especially for beginners. Now, though you may see many artists seem to just spontaneously and effortlessly just apply their watercolors, they're able to do this through years of practice. It helps to really plan your approach a bit, especially if you're just learning. Eventually, certain steps will become second nature to you, uh, or not even necessary after a while. But it helps when starting out to take certain preparatory steps before you just jump into applying your paint to paper. So the first one is to always keep a small piece of scrap paper, which you can use to test your colors or your mixes to ensure you're pleased with it before you actually apply them to your art. Sometimes it will take you uh, a few tries before you really get the right color or the right saturation or the right value or just the right amount of water in your brush. Another thing is to take the time to really look at the scene and try to identify and simplify the colors and the saturations and the values that you see because it is never necessary to try to recreate every color that you see in front of you. Oftentimes you'll find that one or two colors in your palette uh, can be used in several different ways and could mix to substitute for several of the colors that you actually see in a scene. Right? So try to not be overwhelmed by all the variations of colors that you may see in a scene and understand that you can actually simplify it to just a few groups of color categories or color families. And the last tip is to make a general plan of how you will use the colors that you have to match or account for the colors that you see. So think about uh, the colors, uh, the values, the saturations you see, and then take a look at your palette and see how you can create that 
that match. So think of what mixes you may have to use. Think of what uh, uh, combinations or what layers you may have to apply from your palette. Think of the ways that you may have to use these two colors to account for that one. Sometimes you have to uh, simplify or even remove a color that you see or, or just completely ignore it and account for the ones that you have to recreate that scene. And this also fosters a sense of um, spontaneity and uh, enable you to feel free to use your mixes and uh, your color uh, combinations and recreate your version of what you're observing. Now it's important to know uh, that it's not possible, nor is it even necessary to capture everything or include everything you see in the scene. In fact, I advise against even trying. Instead, it's best to try to uh, rely on the power of suggestion. We observe, then we uh, conceptualize, we transform, we filter, we edit, and so on, and then transfer this visualization to art form. This is essentially the creative process. So it means you take, uh, you know, you make selective choices about what to include, uh, what to leave out, what to imply or what to suggest, and in the process, experiment with ways on how to do it. And this is perhaps one of the most fun aspects of urban sketching. So here are some simple ways to uh, kind of approach the whole idea of simplifying what you see. Learn to be comfortable with empty or negative space. I can't emphasize this enough. You don't have to fill every space of your paper uh, or of a form or of a building or a tree or whatever it is with stuff. You know, don't give in to feeling you must fill in every detail you see. It's fun to draw only parts uh, of a building or leave out some leaves of a tree. The viewer will fill in what's missing with their imagination. We're engaged with things that uh, demand of us to participate. And that's essentially what you're doing in a sense. Another tip is to sometimes pay more attention to the outline of objects. You know, it helps to not focus so much on the details or what's going on in the internal form. You know, sometimes not even shading is necessary. Think of, you know, when you look at things from a distance, you know, sometimes the details are just a blur and all we can make out is just, you know, a silhouette and it's enough still to convey a sense of what that thing is you know whether it's a person or an animal a building a tree or a vehicle you know whatever it is sometimes we have to learn how to uh, kind of shut off uh, that tendency to want to draw the details want to fill in the details and kind of just look at the shape or the superficial form or the outline of the of the subject that we're looking at and lastly um, take time to practice and experiment with ways to simplify things. You know, as you practice, uh, you'll find that you will have to learn to appreciate the abstract in sketching. You know, understanding that some things that look like scribbles up close can actually appear as something concrete when uh, you're looking at the whole picture. You know, so with simplification, it isn't uh, what you say so much, but what you convey. You know, sometimes you'll have to um, be okay. You know, initially you may be, it may be a little unsettling to know that, oh my God, this does not look like that thing or this doesn't seem to make sense. You know, but you have to understand that sometimes you have to step back and appreciate the whole and understand that people or the viewer will make sense of it. You know, so don't get too tied up with the little uh, um, minute details of things or trying to get every little thing exact. Sometimes you leave a shape open. Sometimes you leave a line incomplete. You know, those little uh, uh, imperfections or things like that can sometimes actually add life and imagination to your drawing. You'd be surprised. Now, looking at a typical scene with so much information, details, uh, and all that's going on, it's normal to feel a bit overwhelmed. Um, you know, where do you start? You know, uh, what do you draw first? Um, what matters? What doesn't? You know, now a nifty little technique uh, to make things a lot easier for you is to break a scene down to a small number of big and simple 2D shapes. This is so useful because it enables you to simplify any scene or any subject for that matter and makes it so much easier to approach. So 
Look at a scene and start finding the major shapes and elements that stand out. The key is to not get caught up with all the little things, the little details, and focus on the larger, more dominant aspects of the composition. You can start by creating simple thumbnail sketches, you know, and it's, it's okay if you come up with uh, more than one versions of the same scene. This is a natural way of playing around with the elements of your composition. You will find yourself trying to figure out which shapes are the more dominant ones. Um, you know, now it's important to try not to have too many shapes because you're attempting to simplify the composition, you know, to, to find what's most important and make them the basis of the sketch's visual impact, you know, kind of um, like writing a summary, so to speak. Now, when breaking down a scene, it's important that you keep the shapes simple. So you want to have few shapes, big shapes, and you want to have simple shapes. Think, uh, you know, triangles, squares, rectangles, uh, circles, ovals, diamonds, pentagons, you know, essentially simple, flat shapes. So think of the silhouette of animals, of people, trees, plants, you know, uh, buildings, uh, vehicles, you know, all these things can all be reduced to simple geometric shapes. It is also important to know that negative shapes are very much a part of the composition. Their roles in a composition are just as important as the positive shapes. So imagine your view as a window or a flat plane, and you're breaking apart that plane just like you would a jigsaw puzzle, all right? Uh, because this enables you to see that all parts of your view, even the empty sky, for example, plays an important role in bringing things together. Now, this is another really fun aspect of urban sketching. There are just so many ways to uh, frame your sketch. You know, what's cool is that each frame can actually affect the way the viewer experiences the scene. You know, so uh, it can determine how their eyes move through the sketch, uh, the type of, the type of uh, atmosphere um, the sketch creates, and even the type of emphasis that's created or where that emphasis is created. So explore a variety of framing possibilities for your sketches, you know, whether to, uh, for example, to make it a portrait uh, orientation or, or portrait frame or a, a landscape or square or circular or, or uh, irregular or uh, a hybrid of different frames, you know, try to ensure that the frame you choose suits the scene or what you want to capture. More vertical orientations or frames are nice for emphasizing, you know, tall structures like buildings and uh, trees and so on. Um, and especially in cases like a three point perspective drawing, when uh, you want the viewer to uh, have a sense of looking up or looking down. Horizontal uh, frames or orientations are also a really popular way to frame your drawings. Um, they're especially nice for panoramic views and two page spreads and like uh, multi uh, vanishing point compositions. It's best to frame your sketch based on the scene and how it speaks to you. You know, but uh, at the end of it, just try to, uh, when you choose the frame, use one that actually accentuates the composition in some way. So let's take a look at uh, a few absolutely core uh, concepts or aspects of um, linear perspective that I think is really important to be aware of. Now, the horizon is so important to be aware of and to be able to identify because in many cases, it gives a drawing a sense of grounding and uh, helps to establish a level. Now, it is uh, essentially equivalent to your eye level, the height of your eyes, from the ground and that's how you can easily locate it whenever uh, you look at a scene and it's not immediately apparent try to visualize an imaginary horizontal plane that exists at the height of your eyes from the ground and parallel to the ground plane the horizon um, enables us to determine if we're looking up at something or if we're looking down and as a result it helps us to get uh, our angles right edges right and uh, kind of get all our lines consistent. The vanishing point essentially is the point at which the receding parallel lines appear to meet. Now we must be able to have some idea of where the vanishing point is or are in our scene, right? You must be able to get some sense of where it is. Even if you can't pinpoint the exact location, that's fine. Now you may have one 
uh, or two or three vanishing points in a given scene. Sometimes the, the vanishing point will be found within the scene. Sometimes it can be found outside. Sometimes it can be found um, towards the left, towards the right. You know, there's no uh, specific place where you will find it, but understand that you can be found in different places and it will help to organize the space that you're looking at. So in most cases, if you find the horizon, it's easier to find the vanishing points and vice versa. Another useful aspect of linear perspective is making divisions. Now, uh, dividing up a space in perspective can be tricky, you know, but using this simple technique, it will make the process a lot easier for you. Now, first, let's look at a rectangle or a square uh, and make an X by connecting the opposite corners. Now, where the lines overlap marks the midpoint of this shape. And this is the center line that we, or the center line that we can use to bisect this shape in halves. Now, we could continue to make even smaller divisions of quarters and, and eighths by following this same principle. Just continue to make X's and you'll continue to bisect whatever that shape is. Now let's draw the shape as if we're seeing it in perspective. Now by making that same X, we're now able to find the midpoint again, but note that now the midpoint is closer to the side that is further away from us. So this is true to the principle of perspective that things that are closer to us appear larger than things that are further away. So it makes sense that the half that is closer to us appears larger than the half that is further away. Now this simple method can be used to make divisions or find midpoints of houses, walls, or whatever other architectural feature you may find in a scene. And even for spacing objects like, you know, light poles or trees as they recede in space. Now these three concepts I believe are really fundamental to understanding a, a linear perspective and are useful as guides for at least making your urban sketching, well the spaces in your urban sketching seem a bit more believable. A thumbnail drawing is just a small rough sketch done as a quick study. It is usually uh, in preparation for a uh, final drawing. Now, usually artists use thumbnails to explore and work out compositional issues. Um, you know, they allow you to practice, uh, to plan, to preview ideas, and it's worth it to take the time to complete a few uh, before really starting your final drawing. I can't emphasize how invaluable these little things can be. They only take a few seconds. They don't really need to be complex or detailed. The simpler, the better. So one thumbnail, you know, may focus on composition and design aspects, you know, such as, you know, where will you uh, place your focal point? How will you frame the scene? What will be the orientation you'll use? Will it be landscape? Will it be portrait? And so on. You know, you get to work out composition and design issues way in advance of actually starting your actual drawing. You could also use thumbnails to uh, try out different versions of the same scene, you know, before actually committing or settling on any given one. Uh, many artists do this because at times you can look at a scene and see three, four, five drawings. And sometimes you just want to get a taste of what that drawing may feel like before you actually commit to it. Thumbnails can also uh, focus on the basic elements. So for example, you can have one that focuses on mapping out the value pattern or the light and shadow, you know, or just the overall placement on and layout of values in your drawing. Um, another uh, uh, could focus on shapes, you know, or uh, details or textures or whatever other basic element. You can actually isolate individual aspects of a drawing and focus your thumbnail on any given one. Now, while it's awesome to sketch a scene and be able to capture what you see, there's something even more fulfilling uh, about being able to not only sketch what you see, but to creatively direct the viewer's attention to a specific area of that scene. You know, this enables you to use your sketches to creatively express yourself, to say something, to go beyond just being a recorder and actively choosing to filter information. You know, and plus it's a fun way to really challenge yourself to, you know, to choose what matters to you most and to visually convey that in your sketch. 
the first thing is to take some time to look at the scene and determine if or where uh, will be your focal point in that sketch. So it can be anything you deem to be visually appealing or that draws your interest. You know, so it could be a single item like a rock or a vase or a plant or a tree or a sign or uh, a person, a vehicle, a group of people or objects. It could be an entire area of that scene. It doesn't have to be a particular thing. You know, so understand that a uh, focal point or focal area could be something that appeals to you that you would like to direct your uh, creative energy to and bring that out in the sketch. Now, after deciding uh, on the focal area of your scene, the next thing is to determine how you will convey this to the viewer. Now, other than choosing a unique subject matter, you know, that naturally stands out like it may be the only person in the scene, perhaps the easiest way is to like frame the scene in such a way so that the focal area will naturally be the center of attention. A popular way of creating uh, emphasis is using contrast. You know, there's a variety of ways to use contrast to create emphasis. For example, um, you could use contrast in shapes, in details, so that uh, the area of focus has a lot of attention, a lot of uh, details, a lot of movement, a lot of uh, uh, action, and where other areas of the composition, there is barely anything going on. That type of contrast will easily drive your uh, viewer's eyes to wherever that action is. And another common way of creating contrast is by using values. So if you're using uh, value contrast, then you would ensure that the deepest and uh, lightest values are juxtaposed or placed right next to each other at that focal area. So the rest of the sketch would be dominated by midtones. So this way, where the deepest values are, will clash right against the lightest values. And this will be the place that your viewer's eyes will spend the most time. Now, it may be a bit challenging in the beginning to actually apply emphasis in your sketches, but in time, you will really grow to appreciate it and understand that it enables you to take creative control of your art and use it a form as a form of creative expression. So you're not just this passive uh, recorder, but now you become an active agent in your art and in the very scene that you're capturing. Now you're actually saying something about it. So I'll share a few tips on uh, drawing some of the common elements you may find in urban sketching, like uh, buildings and people and vehicles and trees and so on. So let's start with people. Now, oftentimes we shy away from sketching people because a human figure can be quite intimidating and rightfully so. I mean, the figure is really one of the most complex forms that you could ever draw. However, the key is to draw them using simple shapes. Resist the urge to draw details or to uh, slow down and be meticulous about getting everything right. You know, don't strive for exactness. You know, think again about what I'd mentioned before when breaking down a scene. Think circles, ovals, triangles, rectangles. Think basic, simple shapes and try to capture the pose of the torso first and then add the head and the appendages, you know, the legs and the arms. Think torso first and then just add legs and arms and, and the head and use simple shapes and you'll find that this will be a really fun experience. Now, trees are really fun. Um, but of course, it's easy to be put off or be intimidated, just like with the human figure, by the overwhelming amount of details, especially in the leaves. All right. Now, the key is to ignore them. <laughs> well, at first, you know, focus on the outline, the dominant silhouette, the overall shape and sketch that first. You know, then try to sense the basic light and shadow position and a value pattern and this then just lightly suggest a shadow and some gestural marks or strokes and that's about it keep it simple practice this kind of uh, uh simplified way of approaching trees and they will become one of your favorite subjects in urban sketching now buildings are everywhere right um, the key to drawing a building is first proportion proportion is number one and then the structure and the position now think of where the building is positioned and establish its grounding first. Then start to mark off its limits, you know, 
where's the, the highest point, the widest point? Are there major divisions, you know, and landmarks or are the major doors or windows? Those are the types of things you have to think about before you actually start thinking about the bricks and the fine details. Think about the major aspects, the framework that holds it together. And then, you know, can use dots as a way of marking those areas, those landmarks. And then it's just a matter of connecting the dots and putting it all together. The cool thing is the dots will serve in, in different purposes. One, they'll help you to establish the proportions and the structure. And then they will actually be guides themselves as you actually develop that drawing. You know, you don't want your buildings to be leaning or toppling over. So to ensure that your buildings are seen in perspective and are consistent among each other, you have to make sure that you establish your horizon and establish where the vanishing points are. And then that will give you a sense of how to form the diagonal lines that will form the edges of those buildings. And then from there, you'll find that maintaining that consistency will be a lot easier. You know, doors, windows, roofs, fixtures, and so on, they don't need to be rendered in detail. You know, and here I'll emphasize the importance again of appreciating the abstract, you know, saying more with less, uh, implying more, suggesting more, you know, to convey, not necessarily to say. That's the important thing about, you know, urban sketching. You want to have fun. It's, you're really, uh, it's just like a summary, you know, writing summaries. You're abbreviating. You're trying to be concise. You're trying to uh, be more expressive with what you say without spelling it out. And that's the thing about uh, drawing these fixtures, like windows. You know, try to minimize um, the amount of information that you provide while still conveying the essence of what that structure or that thing is. Now, in this demo, we're going to take a look at this scene and do a sketch as a way of implementing what we learned in this workshop. Okay, so I'm going to start things off by uh, doing a few thumbnails. Um, you'll notice in the first thumbnail, I keep it really basic, really simple. I'm just concerned here with like uh, the basic shapes. I'm just breaking up that picture plane into the basic shapes just to give me a sense of the proportions and where things are. So in the second thumbnail, I've kind of guesstimated where I think the vanishing point is. And what you'll notice as a result of that, it, it kind of harmonizes the buildings or the shapes a bit more. They seem a bit more organized than in the first thumbnail. And that's one of the key things that I had mentioned before about establishing your horizon and uh, vanishing points because they really help to organize your space. In this third thumbnail, I'm actually combining all that I've uh, established in the prior thumbnails. So now I have a sense of where the, the vanishing point is, where the perspective lines are going. And I've also have a sense of the, the basic shapes. So now what I'm doing is kind of building on that uh, information that I already have collected and now organizing the space in a bit clearer way. And also you'll notice that I've also changed the frame. It seems more like a portrait. And that's something I decided by exploring the, the prior uh, thumbnails. So this shows you really the importance of, of doing just a few simple thumbnails. They really give you a good foundation to really start moving forward with how you develop your composition. Okay, so now I'm going to do the underdrawing uh, for the ink sketch. Now, uh, one of the most important things that I want you to pay attention to is the fact that I go from simple to complex. And I go from simple to complex in a variety of ways, in terms of shapes, details, uh, just the general composition. So you'll notice I go from big shapes to small shapes. So you notice that I focus on that main diagonal that's going from the uh, mid left to the lower right. And that is very important because it really cuts the composition about a third and also drives a lot of the way that you enter the scene. And then you'll notice also um, that I start breaking down the picture plane. I'm seeing it as a flat surface and I'm breaking, just like you would a jigsaw puzzle, I'm breaking it apart into these big shapes. And then I go in and work those, those big shapes and break them up into even smaller shapes. And that's when you go into details. But for now, uh, I am not necessarily going into uh, anything too minute because in my mind, uh, the whole purpose of the underdrawing is just to provide a guide for my ink work. 
you know, it gives me it uh, a, a certain level of freedom to not have to worry about certain things. Like, for example, proportion. Um, uh, where the are my lines straight? Are my lines going in the right direction? Have I placed this window correctly? Have I placed this door correctly? Those are some of the things that you're alleviated from. You don't have to worry about that when you're doing your ink work. So I'm kind of thinking about what are the things I don't want to be thinking about when I'm inking, you know, and that's kind of the purpose of your underdrawing. You're not just doing a drawing and then drawing over it. You know what I mean? You're really kind of uh, thinking about your process after this and what you want to free yourself from. So there are certain things you want to be able to enjoy with your inking and you shouldn't have to be thinking about that. So that's what I'm trying to take care of now. So I'm establishing proportions. Proportions is very important. You know, the size of this, the placement of this, where does this go? Uh, where does this end? And so on. So I'm making sure that um, those are some of the main things that I'm establishing now. And as I said before, you know, when you're doing your sketch, you're not limited to uh, just the drawing. You can make notes, you know, you can say, okay, you know what? Remember to uh, use this stroke here. Remember that the light is coming from that direction here. Remember that I'm going to do this when I'm drawing this window, when I'm drawing this plant. Remember, I'm going to use this texture for the leaves. Those are the types of information you want to put down. You're not just doing a drawing for another drawing. That's not the point of doing the underdrawing. You're really trying to establish a guideline for what your ink work is going to follow. And once you do this, you grasp the understanding of what your underdrawing is about. Because, you know, then you'll say, okay, you know what? I'll work out the details here. And in this area, no, I don't have to do that. You know, you realize that you can, you pick and choose. You're selective about where you focus on with your, uh, your pencil drawing. Because remember that drawing is a multifaceted activity. You're thinking about multiple things at once. You know, while you're drawing, you're thinking about, uh, you're sketching, you're thinking about proportions, you're thinking about light and shadow, you're thinking about structure, you're thinking about perspective, you're thinking about shapes, you're thinking about lines, you're thinking about values. There are all these things, you know, it's really a complex activity. So, you know, uh, what you're doing is you're trying to address these different things in different ways and with different levels of emphasis. So that way, when you're inking, you can allow yourself to focus on what you want to focus on. Because at the end of the day, guys, you have to remember this is uh, a fun activity. You want to have fun. You want to be able to relax. You want to be able to really enjoy the process. You know, so the more you're able to focus on that, the more fun you'll have and the more enjoyment you'll get from this. Okay, so I started the inking. And, uh, you know, what I'm going to do, guys, I'm going to share with you my thought process. I'm going to, you know, give you some insight on the way I, I'm thinking while I'm drawing, you know, what are some of the concepts I am addressing and what's really going on in my mind, not just a verbatim step-by-step -step narrative of every single thing that I'm doing, you know, every stroke. Okay, now I'm drawing, you know. Uh, so now something that's very important, as I had mentioned before, uh, I forgot which, uh, I think it was in part two, about uh, simplification and uh, appreciating the abstract. It is so important. I really can't uh, emphasize that enough. Now, the reason why is because when you're drawing, you know, there are two different perspectives you apply. You apply a perspective as the person drawing and uh, you're applying a perspective as the viewer of your drawing, you see. So you have to be thinking about uh, what does this look like? while you're drawing the thing you see so that way it can make sense and this is where the draw what you see and draw what you know comes in because you know you know what you're looking at you know what you're drawing but you have to be thinking also what will the viewer see will they be able to interpret this will they make sense of this you see so uh what that leads to is finding the balance between not being too exact with everything and but still giving enough information so that the viewer can participate actively without doing too much work or being confused. You see, so uh, w it, how that applies to this? Well, what I'm doing is while I'm drawing, I know that I'm being selective of what information I'm putting down. I'm not putting down everything and I'm not even trying. You know, uh, I am abbreviating this. You know, your sketch is an abbreviation. It's a summary uh, of what you're seeing. You see, so you're choosing what information to put down. Now, uh, I deliberately change things. Like, for example, if you really 
you know, look at the image and look at my drawing, you'll notice that, hey, there are four doors. He put three. Hey, there are five windows. He put, you know, four of them. Uh, no, that line is not that. That's not my concern. My concern is creating a version of this view that is for the viewer to enjoy from my perspective. So 10 people can do this scene and come up with 10 different drawings. And that is fine. That's the beauty of this whole thing. That it's, it, it's a creative experience. So, you know, while I am uh, drawing this, I'm actually coming up with things. You know, like, you know, when I'm, uh, I'm drawing uh, this building or this plant, I'm thinking, okay, what leaves am I going to use? Well, how am I going to capture these leaves? And I just do it in the moment. And, and while I'm doing it, I'm saying, hey, I like this. Or I may actually adjust it a little bit. That's a part of the drawing, and that's fine. You know, you don't have to feel you have to get everything correct. And it's always a learning experience. After every drawing, I say, yeah, you know what? I like the way I did that. Uh, you know, I could have done this this way. Note to self, I will do that next time. You see, so it's a critical experience while you're drawing as well. And you should be reflective. And that's a very important part of growing and developing your skill because you have to reflect. If you draw, if you sketch, if you create, and you don't reflect, it is not healthy for growth. It is not healthy for progress. All right, you have to look back on yourself. Look at back at what you're doing and uh, the the lines you make. You know, um, the way you move your hand, the way you grip the pencil, the way you uh, uh, you create your strokes. You know, like here, I'm I'm creating that little uh, the road. I in my mind, you know, I'm saying, okay, these little strokes. How am I going to abbreviate that? Maybe I'll use half circles. I won't use complete circles because I don't want it to be flat. You know, so I'm using these small C-shaped uh, little strokes to actually create that impression. You know, when I'm doing the sides of the building, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, the graffiti. Am I going to draw that? You know, I'll just leave that out. And that, those are the types of uh, decisions I'm making in my mind, you know. Uh, in another drawing, I may actually want to tackle that and say, you know, I'm going to actually recreate this graffiti on the wall because I think it's uh, an important visual aspect of the composition. You see, so uh, I choose to develop what I want to develop based on what importance I want to give it in my uh, composition. So some things is not necessarily formulaic, you know, like I, I this is what I do in every composition. No, I kind of uh, approach each drawing with a different attitude, a different feel to see what speaks to me here. You know, do I feel like this is important to develop? Yes. Okay, I'll do. I'll do that. If it doesn't, I'll I'll abbreviate it. I'll I'll deliberately leave out information so it's not overly developed. I'm not saying much with it. I'm not letting it speak a lot in the work. You know, and that's that's a kind of uh, creative approach you want to take. You know, you want to let the scene speak to you. Don't feel like you're a slave to what you see like you have to account for everything you have to draw everything you have to fill in every detail or it will not be no don't do that i'm telling you if you do 10 drawings of the same scene people will have a different experience with each one that is different and that is a whole that's that's the beauty of this whole creative experience you know that you're creating different versions of that that scene that you're seeing you know, and, and something I've learned over the years is that uh, you have to learn to trust yourself. You know, um, I've had classes before and I've seen uh, many instances where students will not do something uh, and wait for my guidance. And then when I do share, they said, yeah, I was thinking that, you know what I mean? And I'm like, well, that's why you do it. You know, so they were right. They, they were thinking the same thing all along. But for some reason, they doubted themselves. They didn't have the confidence. They didn't have, they didn't believe it was right or it would be the right thing to do, you know, and they wanted my affirmation. They wanted my assurance. Like, yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the path. That's the route to take, you know, and I've realized that it's something you have to just learn to do. You just have to just learn to um, trust your, your intuition, trust your artistic instinct, you know, your mind is saying, explore that, do it, you know, just try it. You know, it, it's not, you're not losing your, <laughs> it's not the end of the world, basically, you know, just take chances with your work, you know, because that's where growth comes from. That's where discoveries come from. 
that's where you really learn stuff like, oh, so this is how you draw this. Or, you know, I discovered a cool way to sketch people. You know, I discovered a really cool way to draw bricks. You know, you, you just do it. You know, sometimes it will, it will sound crazy. It will uh, feel crazy. It will feel awkward. It will feel uncomfortable. But you just do it. Like, you see, like here where I'm doing the, uh, the top of the drawing, I decided mid-drawing to actually use the, uh, the roofs of the building as the edge of the frame. And I didn't know how it would turn out. But if you notice, the pencil sketch, I actually sketched the entire box. And while I'm drawing, I just said, you know what? Let me just, hmm, let me just try this. And I just decided to use the edge of the, of the roofs as uh, the contour. And, and what that does is it, make, it breaks it up, you know, and it makes it a little bit more interesting to me. And those are the types of decisions that you have to make, you know, um, here with the roof. Um, I'm actually using very similar strokes to capture the shingles of the roof as I did for uh, the pavement on the road. The Virtually the same type of strokes. I'm using these C's. The only thing that's different is that I'm actually turning the C backwards. And that's pretty much it. Now, something that's really important to address as well uh, is to be aware of <clears throat> the size of your drawing. You know, uh, we do drawings of different sizes, right? Sometimes we do a small drawing, sometimes we do a larger drawing, you know, but uh, the, the, the point is, uh, this, a small drawing <clears throat> will not yield as much detail or, you know, it's just not possible to force as much detail in it as if you're doing a, a larger drawing. You see, so that's something that you will have to gauge and learn on your own by drawing over and over. You'll eventually start realizing, okay, it is not necessary, nor is it possible for me to uh, recreate this amount of details in a drawing this size. It is not. And you know what's, what's actually uh, even more interesting? The viewer does not expect it either. All right. So that's another thing. You know, if you do really small drawings or if you do really large drawings, know that there's a different level of accountability there. And also, depending on what you're drawing with as well, if you're doing a, a, a drawing, a larger drawing with a bold point, you know, there is not necessarily uh, that much room for really fine details as opposed to if you're drawing with something fine, you know. So uh, <clears throat> and I mentioned that because here where I'm working on the, the doors on the building, the side of the building. Now, if you look really closely, they're really just single strokes and dots that I'm using to filling in the details. And you know what? It is enough, <laughs> okay? Because uh, this is something I've learned over the years, and this is something, if you're just starting, you will learn as well, that it is not necessary for you to put all the information there. And this is what I was referring to about the process of simplification, of learning to appreciate and, and embrace the abstract. It's just like with Impressionism, you know, uh, things up close will look like blurs and, and crap. It'll just look like random arbitrary lines, but it will pull itself together when you step away from it and see it as a whole. And that's the idea here that I know that this building, you, the viewer will look at this within the context of the scene. They will not see these individual doors in isolation. If you saw it, then you'd be confused of what I drew, you'd say, what am I looking at? But because you're looking within the context of this drawing, your mind takes care of that. In other words, I have to just imply or convey and you will conclude. You, the, there's a psychological aspect of it where the viewer takes uh, over for you. They, they, they it complete the race for you, basically. You know, so don't feel you have to fill in everything, all right? And if you're, if you're sketching, especially with ink, it's also very important that you keep things loose. If you notice that a lot of the contours, my lines are broken, you know, I deliberately do that. Because, you see, when lines are uh, completely straight and connected, it engages the viewer in a different way. It's almost psychologically that you're telling the viewer it is closed and what you have drawn is concluded and is, is definitive and it is what it is. But when there are lines that are broken, it engages the imagination a lot more. There's a lot more participation, especially for sketching. For sketching, it's very important that you especially leave lines loose and open. 
because it engages the imagination more because after all it's a sketch it is not a finished drawing where you're trying to make it photorealistic you're capturing every detail you know you're really just abbreviating and by abbreviating it's even more important that you keep your lines loose you keep it a bit scattered a bit open you know and that enables the viewer to come in and fill in the uh, missing information and your work is more engaging more expressive it actually says a lot more so pretty much all the uh, ink work is done and uh, if you'll notice it looks pretty bland you know there's no uh, particular area that stands out and uh, that's the whole idea here now what I'm going to do now is just go in um, and start deepening some areas uh, uh, making some outlines more bold and as a result of that just make the work a bit more visually appealing and visually interesting you know uh, creating some uh, contrast with the strokes um, you know changing the varying the weight a bit and this will add some interest and also leave it a bit open if later on I decide like you know what I want to apply some uh, some watercolor so that's one of the reasons why I'm leaving it a bit open as well um, generally if you know that you will apply watercolor to a sketch try not to do too much shading with your ink leave it a bit open let it breathe a bit you know leave your lines broken and uh, and let the work kind of uh, give some open space so that the viewer can actually go in and move through it because that's really what will be happening the viewer is uh, going through the work going from image to image going from detail to detail and it keeps it's almost like having a, a puzzle uh, that enables the the viewers eyes to wander all through it Okay, everyone, this was a really fun and compact learning experience. Uh, it was truly awesome, and I enjoyed going through some of these essential concepts of urban sketching with you. I hope you found it useful um, and uh, was inspired in some way, and will leave with something that you can apply to your own work. So thanks so much for joining me, and I'll see you next time.